Today, I'm going to show you some of the greatest stories ever told in games. Not because of the narratives, characters, or worlds, but because of the questions they ask. Questions that will reach at the very core of your humanity, beyond the door to our souls, that will haunt you forever. What is life really about? What should we be focused on in our daily lives? And what's the key to real happiness and fulfillment anyways? Well, Cyberpunk 2077 may just give us the answer. You see, at its heart, Cyberpunk is a misunderstood game about the struggles to find fame, fortune, and pleasure in a world permeated with loneliness and debauchery. But instead, forgoing all of that for the quiet life. Early on in the game, you're a mercenary for hire who gets caught up with an assortment of bad and memorable characters alike, which results in you trying to steal potentially one of the most important pieces of tech in the world. And this entire adventure at the start is about finding glory and fame, about becoming, as you hear a doll tell you in game, the best in all of Night City. But there's another question right at the start of this adventure that a lot of people don't give enough thought. When Dex, a man who hired you for your biggest mission yet, asks you whether you want to go out in a blaze of glory and forever be remembered, or instead, forego all that for the quiet and peaceful life. It's an interesting question, one that lots of us might have pondered in our own lives, and for many of us, the answer is we do want to be someone special. And this is what Cyberpunk's story is actually all about. For almost every character we meet in game, when we first encounter them, they are hostile, angry, twisted, or even evil. I think about how Johnny screams in our head and wishes us harm when we first speak to him post-surgery, or how Takamura sees us as a lesser human being that is simply a stepping stone towards his real goal, or how Judy and Pan Am write us off at first as nothing but a lonely merc. But as you start to play more and more of this game, its philosophy starts to seep into you. That crazy girl with rainbow hair suddenly has to watch as her only real friend takes her life right beside her and she cries in pain on our shoulder. The corpo sellout who sees you as nothing but a tool, opening up about his ruthless and violent childhood that made him dedicate his life to honor and purpose. The terrorist trapped inside your head who goes from one of the most annoying asshole characters I've seen in a game in a long, long time to a man stricken with so much pain and suffering deep within his soul who never for his entire life found anyone who truly understood and loved him. It's moments like these in cyberpunk that make it so special. What originally starts out as a journey to solidify ourselves as a hero of sorts, that kills, deceives, and does whatever it takes to forever put their name in the pantheon of the greats, slowly over time transitions into an emotional character piece, about a protagonist who has been destined to meet their death with people who have undergone great suffering or hardship all around them. All of whom, deep down, want what's actually important in life. Family, friends, and those around us who if we were to die, part of their souls would go with us. And it's at the very end of this game that we really learn this lesson. If we choose to storm Arasaka and forgo our friends and family, we eventually wind up in a demented nightmare on a space station. Not sure of the future or even the present, becoming someone trapped in their own head. Someone who gave up everything, but has become rich and famous, riding out the end of their life in a blaze of glory that will forever be remembered in the streets of Night City. But if we choose our family, our friends, like the Aldecaldo ending where we storm Arasaka with a ragtag group of outsiders who we've grown a relationship with over the whole game, then yeah, we don't get the money. We don't get the cool massive penthouse we get to play at at the end of the game, overlooking the whole city with our own private driver. In fact, we don't even get to keep our life. What you do get, though, in those final moments, that final cutscene, is a man or woman next to the person they truly love, knowing that now all of their hopes and dreams will never come true, and yet, with an even bigger sense of hope in their eyes and heart, knowing that by forgoing all of the things that they thought would make them happy, they found what really would. The quiet life in Cyberpunk 2077 is a question Dex asks us in the very beginning, and it's one we get a very clear answer to by the end. Because no matter how the game ends, or what characters you grow to love or hate, the core of this story and what makes it special is those moments, sitting with Carrie on the boat and listening to a song while the waves of the ocean crash against the bow, swimming with Judy underwater and seeing her light up talking about the joy that her childhood brought her. That's what life's about. It's not about the money 
or the fame or glory. Too many times in our real lives, we focus on things we think will make us feel content or happy inside, on becoming someone or something that's held up by society as special. But in reality, maybe what we should be focusing on is those around us and less on ourselves, on the people we love and the people that need help. Because if there's one thing that cyberpunk shows us, it's that the quiet life, the one where your purpose and meaning is more focused on helping others and being a good man or woman to the people around you, is a life much more worth a living. If we focus on the hedonistic pleasures of money and power, then one day we will simply wind up within a prison of our own mind, without anyone there to save us. You know, there's an ending in this game that a lot of people haven't seen, and it's the saddest one. One where you decide that everything just wasn't worth it, and instead, you take your own life. Because at the end of the day, it's all pointless anyways, right? You're going to die regardless. But it's in this ending that you see the true effect you can have on those around you, how much they care about you, and not only that, how much you care about them. Seeing firsthand the absolutely devastating effect giving up on yourself has on those around you quite literally is one of the most meaningful moments in a game ever. Seeing the pain in people's eyes who you have spent hundreds of hours with, showing you firsthand that you matter, that they matter. Still, Z. Did you even think about, you know, what happens when... I... Shit, I can't do this. So what will it be then? A blaze of glory with all the money, fame, sex, and rock and roll you could ask for. Or the quiet life, where your days will be more mundane, but your heart will sing. What really should be the focus of our lives anyways? One of the most profound questions and answers any game has pulled off. And we're only just getting started. What does it really mean to be you? It's a weird question, and one we often don't talk about that much. But after playing Planescape Torment, this idea will consume your mind. Originally released in 1999, Planescape Torment is a game based on the Dungeons & Dragons universe that takes place specifically in an area called the Outer Plains, which is kind of like the afterlife for our universe, where depending on the type of character you play as, determines where your ultimate fate lies, either in the heavens, hells, or limbos of the afterlife. When you start the game, you wake up as a character known as the Nameless One in the Eternal Afterlife, who has no idea who they are or what's going on. But you find inscribed on a note instructions on how to learn about your true identity, and this starts you off on your adventure. You get to meet with 10 different and distinct tribes, all with their own deep philosophies and ways of life, ultimately only getting to choose a couple to align yourself with. And while all of these tribes offer their own very introspective philosophical thoughts that deserve a video in their own right, the real core question this game asks comes from the ending of the main story. You see, after finding a woman named Ravel, you come to the realization that you are actually the reincarnation of a truly sick individual. Countless years ago, the original Nameless One committed deeds so horrific and unimaginable that he was banished to the deepest depths of the afterlife. The worst of all the Outer Plains, home to endless suffering and death. And in order to atone for his actions and thus be placed in a more lenient plane in the afterlife, the Nameless One came to Ravel with a proposal. Ravel would force him to become immortal and thus suffer in hell forever, but by proxy, allow fate to put him in a new and less hellish plane. Ravel agreed to these terms on one condition, that the Nameless One would provide her with a riddle that no one could solve, asking the question, what could change the nature of a man? And so Ravel split the Nameless One into two, an immortal being that would forget their memory upon each reincarnation and death, and a deity of pure evil known as the Transcendent One, a being that would remember the memories of each Nameless One into eternity. And lo and behold, the final boss of the game is this Transcendent One, who you must either kill or join with in order to stop the never-ending cycle of torment for the Nameless One, where we at the very end of the game find this harrowing speech between the Nameless One and Transcendent Ones. Then this is my final question. What can change the nature of a man? The question is meaningless. Nonetheless, before there is an ending between us, I will hear your answer. Then this is my answer, and you are the proof. Nothing can change the nature of a man. You're wrong. If there's anything I have learned in my travels across the plains, it's that many things can change the nature of a man. Whether regret, or love, or revenge, or fear. Whatever you believe can change the nature of a man. Can. 
Then you have learned a false lesson, broken one. Have I? I've seen belief move cities, make men stave off death, and turn an evil hag's heart half-circle. This entire fortress has been constructed from belief. Belief damned a woman whose heart clung to the hope that another loved her when he did not. Once, it made a man seek immortality and achieve it, and it has made a posturing spirit think it is something more than part of me. Your defiance will hurt you more than any wound in this place. Belief cannot change the nature of a man. I think it can. I think belief could even unmake me, if I believed enough. This final speech puts into context the biggest question in the entire game, which is saying a lot considering Planescape Torment is full of so many. Is there anything that can truly change the nature of a man? When we play as a nameless one in game, we do go through each quest and objective out of our own volition. Throughout all the philosophical questions and moments in game, we have full autonomy to choose as we wish. But in those final moments, we learn that none of it mattered. The true nature of ourselves was always someone born of pure evil, someone who deserved to be stricken to the deepest depths of what we would call hell. No matter what actions we take, no matter what decisions you make in game, it can't change the fact that you were a creature born of pure evil, who has simply forgotten their past. Maybe no matter who you are today, we must always live in the shadow of the person that we were yesterday. But is that really the case? After all, what is it that can change the nature of a man? Is it the struggles we go through? The pain? The suffering? Is it the ideas we adopt over time and the characteristics we inherit with age? Can a man truly be changed? Or are we destined to a fate from which we cannot break from its shackles? Oftentimes in our real lives, you hear sayings like people don't change or once a cheater, always a cheater. It's because at the deepest core of our humanity, it's often assumed that no matter how hard we try, there's an essence within all of us that we can't escape. And it's only with time that this sense of self becomes even harder and harder to budge against. But I personally think that as the nameless one says, there is a nature within all of us that can be melded, altered, and left behind. That fire in our souls to see our image with disgust, to be inspired by pure hatred, love, or duty to become something greater. But then again, maybe for those of us that do change, it was never a change at all, but instead a light within our souls that was always there. So can the nature of a man be changed? Well, to be honest, my guess would be that whatever you think the answer to that question is, might just have a funny way of coming true. What exactly is it that separates us, humans, from everything else? Why is it that we fight so hard for the lives of people we don't even know, yet allow for the slaughtering of millions of apparently lower life forms without even a second thought? And what does it even mean to be alive anyways? Well, Soma, Soma sets out to make us ponder all of these elusive questions. The game starts with you playing as a man named Simon, who has suffered an almost fatal car crash that resulted in major brain damage and hemorrhaging. And in order to hopefully stop what could be a harrowing descent into madness, Simon checks himself into a new and experimental brain scan procedure that will let scientists study his brain further for finding the best solutions for treatment. But during the procedure, Simon blacks out, and when we awake, we're in a very dark and desolate research facility, with no idea what's going on. And as we play the game more, we slowly find out that we are actually now stuck at the bottom of the ocean, in a high-tech underwater Omega space gun facility that is being used to launch satellites and other heavy objects into space. The question is though, how did we even get here? Well, the big reveal in the game is that during the procedure we went through, a scan of our brain was actually taken, which was later used in this underwater facility named Pathos 2 almost a hundred years later. The reason for this is that a cataclysmic comet hit Earth years prior and resulted in all life above water presumably dying, meaning the only humans left are those in the underwater Pathos 2 base. But as you soon find out, even those remaining humans, including yourself, are nothing but copied consciousness from previous volunteers in this experimental brain scan program, who are now being kept alive by a super artificial intelligence on board Pathos 2 called the Warden Unit, or WAU. The Warden Unit's main directive was change to preserve humanity at all costs, once those on board learned of the cataclysm above water. And in order to do this, the Warden Unit actually designed an ARC, or digital black box housing the consciousness of countless human beings, that it's planning on launching into space before the potential 
total collapse of the entire Earth. In the end of the game, we even get to see this for ourselves, as Simon reunites with some characters he has met in game that before were just copied minds, but are now fully simulated in an idyllic world. The reason this is so interesting though is because of the questions it asks us. First of all, what does it even mean to be human? We go through a large portion of the game thinking we are a man going through some sort of nightmare, but come to the realization that everyone we have been talking to, including ourselves, is nothing but a robotic construct, which makes us start to question our very own reality. Is the Simon we play as at the start of the game, one with flesh and blood, a body of his own, the same Simon that is housed in that robotic underwater diving suit? If Simon's consciousness were to be uploaded again into another machine, would that then stop being Simon? Would that simply be him yet again? The reason this thought experiment is so important though is the same reason we are okay with killing animals for food, but not other people, our consciousness. It's maybe the least well understood idea in all of science, which is especially compelling considering we may be on the advent of true AI in our real lives here soon. And the reason it's so compelling is because for many of us, it's our answer to what makes us human. Other animals feel pain, joy, or anger. Simply get a pet dog or pig if you want confirmation of that. But what separates us from other primitive beasts, at least by our current estimations, is that we have some sort of higher sense of self and purpose, a consciousness. But in Soma, we are met with some barriers to this assumption. If consciousness is what makes us human, then would a robot or AI that could mimic that be human too? If and when we can copy our own sense of self into computer storage, would that iteration of us now live on for eternity as a human that never dies? Should we stop the warden unit? Is what it is doing cruel, trapping helpless minds in a prison they can't even realize exists? Or is it the prudent thing to do, to preserve creatures that can feel? And if that somehow doesn't take away something in our humanity, then what is it that actually makes us so special in the first place? It's a fascinating question and one that can consume you if you let it. In Soma, there's even a moment where we can watch the recording of a man slowly discovering that he's not actually himself, but just a copy of who he was, now placed in a machine. It's appalling watching the man who was happy and content in life fall into mania and dissolution as his sense of self completely dissolves. And it makes you wonder, are you really you? Because if you are, what exactly makes you, you? If you woke up tomorrow in a new body, would you still be the same person? Or if your brain was placed into a vat, like say the matrix, from which you could live in a dream state forever, then who are you? The man in the vat or the man in the dream? I think for a lot of us, our perception of self comes from a lot of things. Our brains and how we think, our bodies and how we function. But if that conjunction too is nothing but an amalgamation of neurons that can join into what we call consciousness, then maybe humans are nothing more than a sophisticated machine, whose true end goal of living on forever in the stars might just be a solution like we see in Soma and the Ark. Or maybe we don't even need us. Maybe the formulas and algorithms intrinsic to humanity can be solved. Maybe what we find beautiful, daring, inspiring, and terrifying alike can all be boiled down to a simple equation, as we see in modern day AI algorithms creating beautiful pieces of art and now music. For me, the scariest thing that Soma makes me think about is it makes me ask myself, what's so special about me anyways? And what makes me, me? It's one of those questions we may never be able to answer, and by the time we can, it's probably already too late. But as sad as it sounds, I see it in a beautiful light too. Maybe that sense of happiness, of freedom, of looking out into the stars and dreaming of more, maybe that which at its very core makes us human, is something that we can solve and something we can give back and spread throughout the rest of the universe. The Fermi Paradox asks why we haven't found any intelligent alien species yet in a universe with every likelihood pointing to the fact that we should have. Well, maybe it's because instead of looking for them, we need to make them instead. In fact, maybe that's all we are in the first place, a simulation of sorts. And if we are, maybe that doesn't actually even change anything, no matter how weird it makes you feel. Maybe a compiled version of you has just as many feelings and emotions, as many wants and desires, and just as much meaning as the real you. Some questions to think about, for sure.
It seems like everyone is so negative nowadays. Whether it's politics, gaming, or just general worldviews, the majority of people appear to be nihilists nowadays, struggling to find meaning in a world so full of hate. But as an unrelenting optimist myself, I can't help but love life and the challenges and joys it can bring alike, and that's why I find the core message of The Outer Wilds so enticing. The game revolves around an unnamed player character who wakes up on a small planet with an observatory and multiple NPCs. You are a space explorer and must find your ship and then venture out into the stars to see what's out there. But quickly you discover that you are actually trapped in a time loop where every 22 minutes exactly, a massive sun right next to your planet goes supernova and kills everyone, causing you to wake up once again on this small planet by a campfire. And so it's your goal out of your own volition to figure out what's going on here, where you slowly discover that an ancient race of aliens known as the Nomai were here before because of a mysterious signal they found called the Eye of the Universe, which apparently held great power. On all the planets in the solar system, you can find remnants of the old Nomai tribes and their research, including things like the Ash Twin Project, which would harness the power of a dying sun to send things back in time, hence why you find yourself in the predicament you are in. And also other massive machines like the Orbital Cannon, which would launch large probes into space at random in an attempt to find the Eye of the Universe, which was a massive anomaly of small quantum mechanical particles that would only form when they were observed. So it's clear then that something big is going on here. But the real revelation of Outer Wilds is that there isn't anything you can do about it. No matter what order you travel to the planets in, no matter what discoveries you make, the same things always happen. Even if you do get the final ending of the game, after 22 minutes the sun still goes supernova and the solar system ends, being sent back into an infinite loop. But during the final ending of the game we get to make one last piece of progress. Finally finding the hidden coordinates to the Eye of the Universe, the player is able to warp themselves to its location using ancient Nomai vessel technology, and there they find quantum versions of various characters they have met before, who can work together to create a big bang that will give rise to a new universe entirely. The message of the game, at its very core, is that no matter what you do, the universe is coming to an end, and this Eye of Mysterious Power will create a new one entirely, no matter what your actions are. It's nihilism in its purest form. Nothing we do matters. No choice we make affects anything. The universe's values and structure cannot be known or communicated. We simply exist, and we have no real purpose. But to me, Outer Wilds is a game about accepting this lack of purpose, and instead seeing our lives for how great they can be. The game is a perfect example of the phrase, it's not about the destination. It's about the journey. Sure, no matter what we do, this universe is teetering on a path of destruction and rebirth, but the beauty in it all is those moments we have on each planet, and with each character before its death. Outer Wilds isn't about discovering a universe that is about to be forgotten forever, it's about just finding and enjoying the little things, those small revelations we make, those slower moments where we come across characters playing music into the echoes of eternity, about taking in every little moment in our lives and realizing while it all may be pointless, Maybe we can make it meaningful all on its own. You know, this game has a DLC that a lot of players haven't seen called Echoes of the Eye, where we get to learn about another ancient and highly sophisticated race that also found the same signal of the eye in our solar system. And we learn that they too created massive machines to try and figure out its meaning. But these owl-like creatures did. And what they discovered was that the eye was a quantum consciousness of sorts that was going to destroy and recreate the universe for some unknown purpose. And when we end the game using the final DLC path, we get one final cutscene where we can see the player character and a powerful creature called the Prisoner helping each other to create a new universe, with bright colors and hope all around. The reason Outer Wilds is so powerful is because it asks us one of the most beautiful questions of all time. Maybe life is meaningless. Maybe everything we do is without a real purpose, but maybe that's okay. Maybe that's what makes life so beautiful in the first place. Outer Wilds is about accepting the fates we have in our own life, the good and the bad, and realizing that it's the journey and the venture we go out on that makes us human. And also it's about daring to accept our futures, ones where our entire universe may be dying, but that it could lead to something even more beautiful in the future. In the Outer Wilds, we're taught to be optimistic in the face of nihilism, and instead embrace a future and universe we can never predict. And it's a message I personally very much align with. Because while I am one of the very few who found the game to be lacking in many ways, the story and meaning behind it all is one of the greatest tales ever told. 
Life isn't about being in control or understanding everything. Sometimes in our lives we'll face obstacles the likes of which we never expected and we can never predict the outcome. But it's in these moments and how we handle them, how we construct our journey, how we learn from the elders of our past and their echoes, and how we forge a new world for those in the future that give life a meaning that can't be taken away, even in the last breaths of a dying universe. It's one of the most profound thoughts a game has tackled, and in my opinion, it did it in such a great way. Nowadays, everyone's so negative, and I know why, because it's easy. It's easy to look into the void of the universe, into the void of your mind, and give up. To assume that because you have no real effect or purpose, that you're meaningless. But the real courage comes from those who can look into that ether and realize that maybe that just gives us the most meaningful life of all. To fill our worlds with purpose and respects to the past and hope for the future. I can't tell you whether the universe has a purpose or meaning, but you can tell yourself how you can feel in the face of it. A powerful realization, for sure. Isn't it strange how we always seem to be looking outside of ourselves for all the answers? No matter what we buy, how we act, or what opinions we hold, no matter where we are in life, we as humans strive for the validation and recognition of others. And if we don't get it, it drives us insane. I think when we look back decades from now on our modern era, one of the defining characteristics of our generations will be our reluctance to accept responsibility and any sort of judgment alike. And the reason this is so interesting is because it's core to how we operate. And no game posed these questions better than the original Deus Ex from the year 2000. Deus Ex told a story right for conversations, so picking just one is a difficult task. In the game, you discover that a secret organization of Illuminati members have had control of the world for hundreds of years now. But with the advent of the internet, they started to lose their grip on societies as random people were able to quickly spread misinformation and ideas. The Illuminati, which feared for its power, had a council of five main leaders who disagreed on how to handle the situation. But eventually, one man named Bob Page won and was able to either kill, ruin, or drive out the other members, with one of the survivors being Morgan Everett, who sets out to try and stop Bob. Bob believed that the only way to save humanity from their own doom because of the internet was to implement a series of plans in order to have himself ascend to a human-machine hybrid that he saw as a god. First, Bob would release a contagion known as the Great Death, which would kill millions, similar to COVID almost. Then he would trick governments across the world into consolidating power, after which he would imprison multiple Americans and gain control over the internet, after which he would merge with it. So overall, the game tells a story that warns of the power of the internet itself, and the harsh consequences it could have on humanity, as well as what it really means to be a god, and also asks if the world is run by an Illuminati figure. And while all these questions or ideas are fascinating in their own right, there's one question from the game that, for me at least, is a much less asked one, and also one that I personally find very fascinating. Remember Morgan Everett, another member of the Council of Five who was originally driven out by Bob? Well in game, he is the main guy who helps you take Bob down, and has created a handful of his very own AIs, some of which have become sentient, hoping they can solve the issue. Well one of these AIs is actually a prototype in Morgan's residence, and if you walk up and talk to it in game, you get this very interesting interaction. You underestimate humankind's love of freedom. The individual desires judgment, without that desire. Morpheus is obviously a very high level intelligence, and with that comes some interesting observations on humanity. The individual desires judgment. Without that desire, the cohesion of groups is impossible, and so is civilization. It's an interesting idea, isn't it? And quite likely true, too, because we do as humans strive for judgment. As Morpheus says, it was first the gods that judged us, and then as Nietzsche proclaimed when the gods had died, we had tried to replace them with machines. Nowadays, it's so often that we see people who cannot take judgment, that at even the very mention of any character flaws are flung into a rage, but maybe that's because we have lost our way with judgment itself. We lost the gods that once gave us reason and meaning, and without them we have been afflicted with a sickness. It's natural for us to assume we want our freedoms, freedoms to judge ourselves, to make choices, and decide the fate of our own lives. But as experiment after experiment has shown us, we as humans don't crave freedom. We crave judgment. When we are given freedom, we simply become paranoid. 
like the famous jelly bean experiment, where it has been observed over and over again that given the choice between a hundred different flavors of jelly beans or just two, humans almost unanimously are more happy when given less choice, less freedom, because it allows us to focus more and not become overwhelmed. And in our modern era now too, we see ourselves daily giving up freedoms of autonomy, speech, and even privacy to governments and big corporations that feed off our data like vampires. But as much as we want to blame these powerful forces for what has happened, maybe it was just part of the human condition all along. Because we as humans crave judgment. We don't crave freedom. We need systems and laws in place that provide us with a structure from which we can identify who we are, whether that be good or evil. Before religions provided this, they gave hope to the hopeless and meaning to the meaningless. And whether these arrangements were actually good is up to interpretation, but what they did provide was judgment a way for us to formulate ourselves in this crazy world. And now with the advent of artificial intelligence and the internet, it seems clear that we as a species are choosing to forgo our freedom to see the world as it is, instead to create institutions that tell us how to. Maybe Bob and Deus Ex wasn't so wrong after all. Maybe only by once again taking power as the Illuminati could the world become right as it once was. After all, a humanity without a god, without judgment, is a humanity on the brink of destruction. But maybe, maybe he wasn't right either. And there might just be something deep within all of us that gives us that meaning, should we look deep enough. It's the argument between intrinsic and extrinsic moral value. For me, I know I crave judgment, and I know you do too. For as much as we are told to focus on ourselves, we are social creatures, and it's only in the eyes of our peers that we find meaning, our purpose. Because it's in the eyes of others that we see ourselves. So the question then becomes though, can their judgment be of their own volition, a society born of society, or must we have a bigger organization, a structure for all that, which makes us human? Judging by where we are now in society, we may just be about to find out. What would you be willing to do to save your family? Would you allow yourself to become the very thing you tried to fight against in the first place for what you see as the greater good? Papers, Please sets out to ask us these very questions. In the game, you play as an immigrations officer for a fictional dystopian Eastern Bloc adjacent country called Arstotska. This fake country is bordering directly with many opposing nations, and as such, you as a player play a vital role in making sure that no one gets in who shouldn't. This means that you're only paid based on passports that you correctly allow in or deny. And considering that in-game you have a starving and poor family back home, including some very young children, every little ounce of money you can get counts for keeping everyone alive. And the tension in the game is what it is most known for. There are many people forging fake passports or giving sob stories about why they should get in. And only by denying entry to these starving and desperate families can you feed your very own. On top of this too, further into the game, some shady characters like mob members or corrupt politicians come to you offering large sums of money in order to illegally let people through, meaning by doing the quote unquote wrong thing, you can guarantee your family another day of food and safety. It's a game that pushes at the very core of what it means to protect those you love, and turning away helpless families from borders in order to save your own is a panic-inducing situation. Maybe the most poignant of all the moments in the game, though, comes from a man named Georgie. You first meet Georgie as a young lad trying to find entry into your country with a comically forged passport, full of scribbles and childlike drawings. It's a good laugh for an otherwise dire situation, and any player trying to make the obvious choice denies Georgie entry and sends him along his way with a wink and a smile. And time and time again, Georgie comes back with progressively more sophisticated passports, yet each time still having faults that make it obviously forged, meaning with each arrival, just as quickly as Georgie comes, you send him away again. But one day he comes to you with what seems to be a perfect passport. No errors, no scribbles, and it looks like everything checks out. And while your intuition tells you it certainly is a forgery still, there's nothing you can do to be sure, and by letting him in you almost get a sense of relief that he finally figured it out. Where this situation becomes truly interesting though is towards the end of the game, when the country you live in suddenly looks to be on the brink of war with its neighbors, meaning you and your family could be in big danger. But not only that, the government has started confiscating citizen passports in order to force people to stay and fight, meaning your family would surely die. And it's at this moment that you can now reach out to Georgie and ask him to help you forge a new identification in order for you and your family to escape. 
The irony of it all is that over the entire span of the game you were tasked with catching liars, cheaters, and apparently bad people, many of whom were only lying in order to save themselves from a bad situation. But in the end, you become the very thing you tried to fight against. A man and his family forging passports in order to try and get into another country. Before where you rejected so many others in order to help your own family, now you must pray that no one rejects you in order for your family to survive. It's one of the most powerful twists in an otherwise very laid back and some would say boring games that really puts into perspective just how important, well, perspective is. Because what Papers, Please makes us think about is how everyone has their reasons. Before when you denied people you wish you could help, it was because you needed to help those you loved first. And then when you went against everything you originally signed up to protect, it was to protect yourself and those you loved. We as humans tend to be selfish creatures, especially in situations of immediate need. During times of struggle, turmoil, or confusion, we often turn to lying, cheating, or a distinct lack of empathy in order to satiate our needs. But too often too, when we become these things, we hurt others in the process. And as we have all been told probably too many times in our lives, life isn't fair. And many times prosperity for one must come at the expense of another. And this point of humanity is seen in no better situations than countries on the brink of catastrophe, where everyday people around you are suffering. So the question then becomes, should you screw over those you don't know in order to protect the ones you love? If you have to deny starving family food in order to feed your own, would that be a sacrifice worth making at the expense of your soul? Or would it simply make you a monster? The same one that had you been in the starving family's position, you would have felt rage and vitriol for. When life is calm, it's easy to be a good person. It's easy to give to others, and even more help them with whatever they need. But it's only when we are truly met with extreme hardship that we can see the character that we have inside. No one knows their strengths until they are tested, and no one knows their morality until they're in a world with none. So if Papers, Please teaches us anything, it's to always question not only your own reality, but the reality of those around you. Oftentimes when people are doing things you would find heinous or monstrous, it may be because a monster is all they have left within them to survive. If you had to defend your family, would you steal? Would you lie? Would you give up all those moral studies you learned about in your life? Would you kill? For those of you who answered that question just now in your head, without ever actually being in a life or death situation, you don't know. And that's what makes it scary, but also beautiful. Because truly, if there is one thing I took away from Papers, Please, it's that while we cannot always control what will happen to us, or even those we love, what we can control is how we react to it. And by remembering to always try our best to understand others and their struggles and thoughts alike, we can become people with much more understanding, and hopefully, more love. Can you imagine the worst life possible? One filled with anger, abuse, torture, and eternal damnation? And if you lived that life, the question would become, how could you escape it? One game gave us a look into a dire situation just like this. Based on the original short story from famous author Harlan Ellison, I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream told the story of the last five people alive on Earth. In this timeline, during the Cold War, the Third World War began to break out, and in order to manage the immense amount of decisions to be made, the United States, China, and Russia constructed three massive supercomputers that put the war into a stalemate. But after numerous advancements, the American AI, codenamed AM, gained sentience and took over the entire world with a distinct hatred for humanity, killing everyone except for five individuals, who would soon realize their fate would be the worst of all. In the short story, these five go on a journey to find food, told from one of them called Ted, who is the narrator. Each of them has been augmented by Am so they do not die even when starving and dehydrated, and also they can live forever. So for the last 109 years, they have all suffered endlessly under Am's rule in an earth covered in wires and electrical equipment that all make up Am. With the biomes of the world being at the five prisoners' feet, and above them being a massive dome of computer parts and only some holes at the top that let light in from a now desolate earth. And throughout this story, the five remaining human beings are subjugated to some of the most horrific and disturbing torture ever, including Am nailing their feet to the ground during an earthquake and ripping their tendons to shred only to glue them back together, causing a month-long hurricane that the five must endure constantly passing out and losing consciousness, one of the survivors, Benny, being so mutilated that he de-evolves into half-man, half-ape, 
and even the survivor Ellen, the one woman in the group, being forced by Anne to provide sexual favors for all the others, with each of them developing major psychological ailments including hallucinations from the unreliable narrator Ted himself. In the end of the short story, the survivors end up going crazy, learning that the food they had dreams of finding was in fact in the ice caves they traveled to, but that Am had tricked them and made the food inaccessible, causing Benny to fly into a rage and start eating the face of one of the other survivors, with the screams of pain causing icicles from the cave to fall to the ground. Ted, realizing this is the first time they have had access to weapons in over a hundred years, grabs an icicle and starts to kill the other survivors in order to save them from eternal damnation. And when it comes down to just him and Ellen, he does the heroic thing and kills her, leaving just him alone now to be tortured by Anne, who for hundreds of years turns him into something not even recognizable as a human being. However, in the game, the story is a little different. All the background characters are the same, but the ending is retcon some, and instead, all the characters are given a challenge to play a game for Am, where each must tackle their biggest fears and regrets. It's one of the most psychological games of all time, where you play through five different campaigns diving into the psyche of each of the survivors their wants, desires, and regrets from their past lives. For example, in Ellen's campaign, you must confront a man who assaulted her in an elevator in a previous life, where Anne brings him back to life to eternally molest Ellen in her own hell. But in each of the campaigns, by either learning how to handle each situation, and or by doing virtuous things like in Nimdok's campaign, deciding not to do more experiments on human beings like he did as a Nazi scientist, then you anger Am and he will cast each of the survivors into a prison of pain, including cages with lasers constantly shooting at them or blazing hot ovens that they're eternally stuck in. And it's only by beating all five of these campaigns and forcing Am into a massive outburst of anger do you finally get the last sequence of the game where it's discovered that those long lost Chinese and Russian supercomputers from the Third War have actually infiltrated Am and allowed all the survivors to trick and best him. And now it's your job to turn off Am's id, superego, and ego. For those that don't know, in Freudian psychology, the human psyche is separated into three main parts. The id, or instincts, which is human's capacity for evil, the superego, or morality, which is human's capacity for goodness, and the ego, which is the sense of self that moderates between the two. So in the end of the game, you must solve the riddle of besting each of Am's psyches. For example, showing your natural human goodness, which will destroy Am's id, since it cannot contemplate how humans would be so kind to a machine that tortured them for over a hundred years endlessly. And it's at the end of the game that we defeat Am and learn that on the moon, 700 humans are being kept in cryogenic stasis, meaning that the human race has a chance to live on and thrive once again. But to me, the most interesting part of the game is the questions it asks us. And maybe the most interesting of all of these is how can we escape hell? In both the short story and the game's narratives, it seems like all hope is lost. No matter what the survivors do, their lives are as bad as it can get, it seems. But while the ending of each is bleak, they both give us a sense of hope in a way. In the short story, Ted becoming a monster who has no mouth but must scream is an analogy to the fact that in the end, through all the pain he had to endure, Am too was forced to find eternal pain, realizing that it no longer had any humans to torture, meaning its meaning and life was gone. And in the game, we learn that by being kind in the face of utter destruction and torture, led to Am finally being bested. If you were one day to be cast into this insane and unbelievable world made up by Harlan Ellison, how would you handle it? What would be the best way to deal with a life not worth living, yet one you could never end? A world that stripped you of all of your humanity and subjugated you to the worst life a human being could possibly live. Well maybe, maybe even in the worst depths of our human condition, there's always something inside of us that can flourish, an eternal light and a fire in our souls that guides us to the good. In each of the five campaigns we play in game, only by making the courageous and righteous choices do we trick Am and escape. And at the end of the short story, Ted kills Ellen, freeing her from her eternal prison, even though he hated her before. It's the selfless and kind acts we can make as humans, even in the face of pure evil, that are what make us human. A propensity within all of us to do the right thing, even if for hundreds of years we see nothing but pain. So if by chance one day you ever find yourself in hell, either the Christian one, Ellison's, or even your very own, remember that there is always a part of us a superego that tends towards the light 
And maybe the only way to truly defeat real evil is to show it that something else exists. Only by proving to Am that humans can be good in the face of unrelenting sadness does his evil cease to exist. So maybe if you want to see a change in the world, if you are tired of suffering, anger, and sadness, then you have to realize there's only one thing you can do. Be kind, be courageous, and do the right thing. And maybe you will still be trapped in that eternal prison despite all of it, but you will inspire or change the hearts of others and lead to a world where 700 humans can still live and recreate again, or one where you know you did the right thing. A world worth living in. Have you ever wondered what it is that makes someone evil? What it is that separates those of us who are good and righteous from those who are wicked and dishonorable? Well, maybe it's nothing at all. Because you see, while humans often strive for the good, there is a capacity within all of us to become and live the life of a monster, one that we can't ever come to terms with. And in Spec Ops The Line, we confront this scary fact of life head on, in a story full of twists, turns, and confusing and sadistic hallucinations. Based somewhat on the famous novel The Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad, Spec Ops The Line tells the story of a band of three covert operatives that are sent into Dubai after a massive sandstorm has obliterated the region, evacuating the entire city and casting the remaining survivors into all-out war and death. Early on in the game we discover that a large regiment of United States soldiers called the 33rd Battalion had originally infiltrated the city denying direct orders from the United States government to leave, instead opting to go in and help the remaining survivors. We play as a man named Martin Walker, who is part of a small team of three covert operatives the United States has tasked with going in and finding out what happened to the 33rd Battalion. And early on, we slowly uncover through Walker's visions that the United States soldiers had actually been attacking and subjugating the civilians to sick and twisted torture in order to gain power over the region. The leader of the 33rd Battalion is a man named John Conrad, and Walker is in constant contact with him throughout the game, disgusted with how sick of a man he is. But the big reveal of the story is that what we have been experiencing is nothing more than a fake reality. You see, Walker wasn't right about the battalion being the bad guys. There's a moment in game where you stumble upon a large group of the 33rd battalion guarding a building you want to get into because you think they're holding civilians hostage. And in order to get past them, Walker makes the call to launch a mortar filled with white phosphorus at them, killing them all in a horrific and painful death. But as you walk past one of the few remaining soldiers slowly dying, you learn that the civilians are not being held captive, but instead were being saved by the soldiers. You just murdered and killed innocents for no reason. But Walker can't accept this and continues on his path of bloodshed until at the end of the game he finally goes to meet his main enemy, Conrad, the leader of the battalion, only to find out that he has been dead the whole time. What you just experienced, the entire game almost, is nothing but a man reliving the sick and twisted hell in his mind that he's created for himself, after the unbelievably heinous acts he has committed and struggled to come to terms with. It's why throughout the game we can see strange visions, like light posts that are normal, only for a few seconds later to be filled with dead and hanged civilians that never existed, or murals of death and despair all over the city that make no sense. Walker was a man with good intentions, but out of his own ignorance and mistakes, committed acts that would only be befitting of the most evil of people. And it's because of this that Walker in many ways began to lose his mind, and succumb to the darkness within himself, within all of us. Because within each of us is that sense of darkness, a primal way of being that we hide and strip away from good company. Men and women willing to kill, murder, and torture in the name of survival instincts and damnation. When pushed to the very edges of our humanity, we become a monster the likes of which we could never imagine. But we as humans too always strive to see ourselves as good, and so in Walker's case it was impossible for him to accept the fact that he was a monster all along, not the so-called leader of the 33rd Battalion, John Conrad. In a way, Walker and Conrad in the game were nothing more than the split personalities of the same man driven to insanity. Conrad represented the evil within Walker, and the man we played as represented the heroic and brave leader who would save innocence at any cost. The end of the game where we can decide to accept the truth of our reality or instead continue on in our lie is a perfect parallel to the struggles of evil in our real world. Many times those who commit evil acts don't see it that way. 
They see themselves as heroes, ones needed to fight back against chaos and injustice. And because of an innate need as human beings to strive for the good, sometimes we can completely create fake realities that justify the actions we have committed. It's horrifying to come to terms with the fact that we all have the capacity to be monsters, to be the evil with which we strive to rid the world of. And maybe the scariest part of all is that throughout history we have seen what this evil can do. Soldiers coming back from war with PTSD, killers refusing to accept the truth of who they are, or simply rejecting their humanity entirely. There's a hell within all of us that should we let it, can become our prison. And it's only by accepting our capacity for bad that we can relish our equally beautiful capacity for good. Maybe the most powerful moment in this entire game isn't the ending or the realization that everything we just lived was a lie, a lie from a truly evil man convincing himself he's the hero. The most powerful moment actually comes from one of the loading screens you get in game if you die and reload that simply says, to kill for yourself is murder, to kill for your government is heroic, to kill for entertainment is harmless. We often don't think about the murder and heinous acts we commit in games like Spec Ops The Line, but if anything, they are just an indication of our capacity and desire for evil, even if it's just in small part. And only by fighting against this side of ourselves and admitting it exists can we make sure we never fall into the depths of our own minds, the deepest stage of hell that Dante's Inferno forgot about. If you want to be a truly positive force in the world, part of that comes from your own capacity to realize your propensity and ability for evil too. That way you never get lost in your own hell. Some big ideas to think about. How do you find meaning in a world where God is dead? If everything you stood for, everything you fought in the name of, and all the beliefs and preconceived notions you held on to turned out to be nothing but a lie, how could you ground yourself in this brave new world? Nier Automata paints a picture of this conundrum. In the game you play as 2B, one of the many human-made androids that are fighting a proxy war against alien machine invaders that threaten the human race on Earth. And as you play throughout the game, you're met with multiple other machines and intelligences that are based on real-life philosophers and their studies. The reason this is so significant, though, is because on your first playthrough, you discover that the humans you have been fighting to save have actually been extinct for centuries. It's a massive secret being held only by a select few in the know, and it means that your sole purpose as an android to protect and serve has been lost. And these robots you meet in game with their different philosophies and ideas serve as a way for you to find purpose in a life where you now have none. For example, a robot in game named Pascal sees life as all inherently good, but his beliefs are challenged when his entire tribe turns to rabid cannibalism, at which point he questions his entire worldview and meaning because how can such horrible things happen to such great people? The real genius of the game though comes from the multiple playthroughs you can do because you realize on your second playthrough that all of those machines you have been killing actually have feelings too. The second playthrough where you play as 9S, who accompanied 2B in the first playthrough, opens with a cinematic of a robot showing emotions and family, which shows that your first playthrough could be interpreted as a mass killing event. Perspective is everything. But still, the most daring question of all in the game is the one it focuses on, finding meaning in a world with none. Because it's only after learning that humans have been gone for so long that we take into consideration more of everything we find in game. The game itself almost has no clear objectives, no guiding light to the end. It seems like every time you complete one main objective, your entire goal changes for no reason. There is no main narrative the whole way through. And that's on purpose. The game structure itself has no meaning. Because just as 2B and 9S have lost theirs, you two are simply walking through a desolate valley trying to hop from one objective to another to find significance in a world which has none. The beauty of the game is through its message, because it's only by bravely venturing out into this mysterious world that you can find your meaning. Nier Automata isn't about a war between sentient human and alien machines. It's a story about finding meaning in life when all seems lost. When God is dead, how can you recreate him from the ashes? Each boss in the game focuses on different philosophies like one who tries to dress up as beautifully as possible, seeing the meaning of life as getting admiration from others. And through each of these bosses in game you start to form your own opinion of why you as androids should continue to live on, what it is you should fight for. After all, it can no longer be humans, they're gone forever. 
So through your multiple journeys then, through the same world and story, you start to garner more and more perspective on just what it is that will give these androids meaning. And while there are so many different outcomes and ways to see this story, maybe the most profound ending shows it best. Because during the so-called E ending, one of many, at the final stages of the game you have the choice to delete your save file. Yes, your full game save that you have likely been spending upwards of hundreds of hours on. But why, might you ask? Because in this ending, by deleting your save file, all the multiple runs and perspectives you have seen in game, you can aid other, real life players on their journey, and potentially help in sparking a revolution to rebuild lost friends for the future. It's only by making this grand sacrifice of what we held most close that you realize maybe you just found the meaning in this universe, in helping others, in giving up your greatest achievements in the pursuit of helping the future of your people, in helping those you don't even know on a journey they may never even see the end of. Maybe the meaning of life always came from inside, from ourselves, not from following idealistically some gods or machines, but from helping to cultivate a future worth living in. I think at the core of humanity is a sense of this, that despite all the atrocities and mistakes of history, the human race has fought on. There's a sense within all of us that even if all of our love, our desires, and our meaning was stripped away from us, we would carry on and try in our lives to create a world that would be better for our future selves, one where a new meaning could be created from the ashes of the mistakes of our past. If Nier Automata taught us anything, it's that maybe God can never die, because God was always all of us. As long as in even one of us, in our hearts, we see the passion and good in the world to help others, then God will forever be alive. The tenacity to live on, forever. But let me know down below what you guys thought of the questions I put on this list, and also what other games and questions you guys personally think are the most profound ever asked in video games. I know there's a bunch of other things I could have touched on here too, like Bioshock, Prey, Metal Gear Solid, Mass Effect, and many more, but for me, these were the ones that truly left the biggest mark on myself. So I'd love to know down below what you guys personally find interesting too. I love topics like this and I really appreciate all the support from you guys as always, so thanks for watching and until next time, have a great day.